Exodus chapter 20 today. I took a run at this message a few months ago and didn't get through with it, so now we're going to hear and hear. Faith comes by hearing and hearing. And uh, so we'll take another run at it as you go into Exodus chapter 20. I've noticed in our country there are three groups of people. The first group, there's a few people that make things happen. Many people watch things happen. And an overwhelming majority have no idea what's happening. Is that right? Well, let's be in the first group. What do you say? We have the tools and the ability through Christ to make things happen. That's good things. Good things. We're not in the business of uh, doing the devil's work, stealing, killing, and destroying. We're in God's kingdom of uh, bringing about good things. Amen. Amen. But today, as this is the last message of this year, I said, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> um, I want to look at a few nuggets in the Word of God that lets us know this coming year could be the greatest year since Christ came the first time. And who's to say it's not? In verse 11 of Acts chapter 20, it says, what I'm going to delve into this morning is types and shadows and nuggets or truths that expand as you understand the Scripture. And then we are to relate these truths to our life and rejoice because we're living in a time that has never been ever. And we're living today for such a time as this. So cheer up, everybody. Uh, the blessed hope is still the blessed hope. But we have some nuggets in the Scriptures that will let us know about when the Lord is going to return. Amen. And verse 11, in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. Now, let me stop there. The word made is the Hebrew word asah, which means to make from pre-existing materials. So in six days, the Lord made from pre-existing materials the heaven and the earth. In other words, everything was already there. See, I, I, we're not new earth theology. Nobody knows when the heavens and earth were created. Nobody knows. So it's futile to speculate. But I can say, based on the Word of God, 6,000 years ago, God gave a facelift to the universe. And that's when Adam was created and made from the dust of the earth, et cetera, et cetera. You know these things, or you should know. We can prove it's been about 6,000 years since Adam not ten, six. For in six days, everybody say six days, the Lord made the heaven and earth and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now, the Lord God wasn't tired like we think about. It's just that God has this truth that he wants to convey to us, six days, six literal 24-hour days, the Godhead worked. And the seventh day, they didn't work. Why? Well, they finished everything. And it was good, see? Now, keep that in mind, six days, and the seventh day, the Lord rested. All right, have we got it? Now, look at Revelation chapter 20 now and, and verse 2. Now, I know darkness is upon the face of the, of the earth, and, but, you know, we don't have to walk in darkness. We walk in the light of God's Word. Thank you, Yvonne, for that message today. Amen. 
And because we walk in the light of God's Word, being led of the Holy Spirit, uh, we need not yield to evil. So we don't practice yielding to evil. We practice yielding to that which is good. Amen. Revelation 20 and verse 2. And he laid hold of the dragon and that old serpent. Now, this is the future, which is the devil and Satan, same person, same being, and bound him, what, a thousand years. Now, drop down to verse 6. Now, a thousand years in the Bible means a thousand years. Amen. God is not in the business of deceiving us. He wants us to know what's happening. Then drop down to verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection, that's the rapture, on such the second death has no power. Now, the second death is being thrown in the lake of fire. But they shall be priests of God in Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Everybody say thousand. Now, a thousand years in the Greek means a thousand years. Now, the thousand year reign that's coming is called the millennium. Everybody say the millennium. millennium. Didn't know you could speak in tongues, did you? The millennium, which means a thousand years of peace. Satan to be locked away, will have no tempter, blah, blah, blah. Christ to be on the earth, ruling and reigning for a thousand years, and the church will be with him, reigning with him for a thousand years on the earth. That's what the Bible teaches, and that's what we believe. But the thousand years to come in type is the Sabbath which is the seventh day of rest. So in six days, God created heaven and earth, which represents 6,000 years of time. And then God rested on the Sabbath, the seventh day, which is a representation of the thousand-year millennial reign to come, the seventh thousand years of time. That's how the Word of God is laid out. So we can understand where we are on God's timetable. Amen. Now, Deuteronomy chapter 34, and let's look at verse 5 to 7 today. Everybody say Moses. <laughs> we critiqued a, a, just tried to be funny. I wasn't very funny. Well, there was a few jokes I told that people laughed, but, you know, this guy shows up on Mars and he... I said, oh, he looks like Moses, but, you know, not really. He's a joke. Everybody says it's a joke. You didn't watch it. Yeah, I know. But we'll get a lot of likes on it, at least one or two. Right, Seth? It's already thrown off of YouTube. All right, well, all right. I don't care. Verse 5. Now, I wanted to give a critique on how to bowl, see, because I'm an expert bowler. If you believe that, I've got some land on the moon, I'll sell you. Never mind. Verse 5, so Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there. Everybody say Moses died. All right. In the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord, and he buried him. God buried Moses in a valley in the land of Moab, moreover against Beth, Beth the poor. But no man knows of his scepter unto this day. So God hid the body because Israel wanted to find the body of Moses and carry it around the wilderness. So God had to hide the body. Now, verse 7 is, is uh, some nuggets here. And Moses was 120 years old when he died. Not 121, not 119, but 120 years exactly. His eye was not dim nor his natural force abated. He had no infirmities of any kind. He should not have physically died, but the time ran out. Moses died on Mount Nebo, and God buried his body in a valley. Moses was not sick. To repeat, time just ran out for Moses. 
but we have some hints here. Now, think about this for a minute. In the life of Moses, God is giving some nuggets about the future for our generation. Moses' life was divided into three parts. The first part was the first 40 years of his life when he grew up in Egypt, and uh, he was the number two man, had everything the world had to offer, but he knew he was a Hebrew. And he had found out that he was going to deliver Israel out of Egypt, and so he tries to do it in the arm of the flesh, and he kills a man and buries him in the sand. Well, that was a no-no. So then he backslid on the run the next 40 years in the, in the wilderness. But God knew where he was. So his second lifespan was in the, in the desert until he became 80 years old. And then, of course, you know the account of the burning bush when God spoke to Moses through the burning bush, etc. But then the last 40 years of his life, so now he's 80 years old, he sees the burning bush, and he's got 40 years to go to fulfill God's will. But he dies, he goes up on the mountain with God, and he physically dies at 120 years exactly. And the question is, is why? Well, first off, his life is a, in type represents jubilee years. Now, now, wait a minute. Now, the Jews, every 50 years, they had a jubilee year. All the debts were paid. All the slaves were turned loose. They were set free. Amen. Now, the bad thing about this is they, they couldn't go borrow any money on, on the 48th year because they only had two years to pay back the loan, and yet the bank had to forgive it all when the 50th year came. So that wasn't too good for those that had to borrow money. But anyway, the fact remains that every 50 years was a jubilee year. 50. Now, Moses' life represented a hundred and twenty jubilee years, which Moses died in 120. He had to die in 120 because in in uh, the revelation is that fifty years times 120 equals six thousand years. Exactly. Therefore, to, for God to lay out the prophetic word so that we would understand, Moses had to give up the ghost, which represented 50 jubilee, uh, 120 jubilee years, or 6,000 years of time exactly from Adam. Anybody listen to me? And if you study chronology, any, and time, history, it always comes down to this. It's been 6,000 years from Adam to our generation. Our generation. We have all the signs upon us. In one generation, we've evolved from the horse and buggy to going to the moon, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. So Israel's jubilee was every 50 years, and all debts were paid totally set free. Now, let's just know in 6,000 years, somebody's going to get set free permanent. In 2 Peter 3 and verse 8 now, praise the Lord. Now, I'm not setting dates, but I'll tell you, we can get real close. Somebody said, well, nobody knows the hour of his return. Even Jesus doesn't know. No, you don't know the Scripture, people. 
When Jesus was on the earth, he said that. How many knows he went back to heaven and sat on the right hand of the Father God? There can be no secrets in the Godhead. That would be craftiness. There's no such thing in the Godhead. So what the Father knows, the Son knows. What the Son knows, the Spirit knows as one. Anyway, the Lord wants us to know so we can be prepared to meet him. The bridegroom comes. And we've got to have our vessel full of oil now. There's five wise and five foolish virgins, and then you know the account in the Gospels that the five foolish came to the, those that had the oil. Oh, give us some oil. And they said, no, we just got enough for our own. Go buy your own oil. And then when they went to buy oil, the bridegroom came. Jesus came. And those with no oil were left behind. It's a warning that this day we need a purpose to draw closer to the Lord than we did last year. Now, 2 Peter 3, 8, the apostle lays some, another nugget on us here, and you all know this. But, beloved, <clears throat> be not ignorant of this one thing. This one thing God wants us to know, that one day with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. That ties in to six days the Lord made all that is and, and rested on the seventh. You see. And so the nugget here is that a thousand years is like one day with the Lord. So it's been 6,000 years or six days since Adam to our generation. Exactly. Exactly. Amen. The seventh day or the 7,000 years will be the millennium to come. There will be a rain on the earth. Our Jehovah's Witness friends have got, got it down about the rain, but they don't understand the sequence of events. Now, in Psalms 90 and verse 4, hallelujah. Hallelujah. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday, when it is past, and as a watch in the night. I, I thought about those that have been in heaven now since the resurrection of our Lord and the Savior. By the way, he's King Lord. Oh, by the way, the Bible doesn't tell us to receive Jesus as Savior only. Really, it doesn't word that. You must accept him for who he is, or you cannot be saved. He is the Lord King. That's who he is. Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Nothing about the Savior. Of course he's the Savior. We know that. Someone said, well, God's not personal. No, no, God's very personal. He knows us one-on-one. -on -one. See? And you have to accept him for who he is now and what he did 2,000 years ago on the cross of Calvary, or you cannot be saved. So when you accept him as Lord, is anybody listening now? Then you are required to obey your king. Not optional. Whatever he says, that's the way it is. No arguing about it because you won't win. Jonah tried. He failed. And so we must accept him on his terms, not our terms. Anyway, back to the point here now. In Matthew chapter 17 now, verses 1 to 3. Now I want to give a little nugget here today. Again, Lord willing. Verse 1 of Matthew 17 says, And after six days, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, his brother, and brings him up to a high mountain apart. I want that to soak in now to your pure minds again, please. After six days, why not five? Why not seven? 
No, six. Six days. Jesus takes him up to a high mountain apart. I tell you, after six days, or 6,000 years of time, there will be a people that will be separated from this earth. That's a fact. The question is, is who's going and who's going to be left behind? The answer is very simple. You must repent of your sins, accept Christ, the Son of God, as your Lord King. In doing so, the blood of He shed on the cross will cleanse you of your wrongdoing, your sins, and you will be reconciled to the Father. You will become then a Son of God and not until. Secondly, you must endeavor to stay in the will of God at all costs. All costs. If you were born again today and you were in the will of God the best you know, then you will get out of here. Praise God. Hallelujah. And I'm saying Jesus is still coming, no matter what the scoffers say. He's still coming. He is still Lord and King. And he will come back and put the devil in a thousand, in a bottomless pit for a thousand years. I had this vision about the church going into heaven, and there's going to be war in heaven. We're going to get in some cheap shots. Here's the deal. The church goes up, and Satan gets kicked out. Furthermore, all unclean spirits and fallen angels are kicked out permanent. Then a little sidetrack I thought about. At the second coming of the Lord, when Jesus comes back to the earth to set up the kingdom, the millennium, uh, all of heaven empties out. Now, that's another thing. Is beyond my comprehension. Who's left in heaven when Jesus comes back to the earth? Well, there could be a few angels around, you know, playing checkers or something. I don't know. But I'll tell you, we have no idea what's coming except it's going to be big and good. And yet the church is asleep. Oh, sleeper, arise. Folks, let us be diligent this year now. Amen. Amen. So in six days, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John. I've often wondered about that. You've got 12 disciples who become apostles. Of course, Judas uh, betrayed the Lord and committed suicide and went to hell. There goes your one saved, always saved. Well, he wasn't saved. Now, you Baptists are wrong on that now because Jesus gave him authority to cast out devils. You don't give a devil authority to cast out a devil. So let's get it right. Amen. You're a troublemaker. No, we just have to know how it is. So Matthias was voted in. I don't like that word vote. No. They jumped the gun. God allowed it. Paul was to be the twelfth one. But nevertheless, the Lord gives us some leeway to make little errors, but it doesn't matter. It all comes out like he wants anyway. See? So we have that will, and we mean well, but sometimes we get ahead of the Lord like I think they did anyway. Verse 2, then, after six days, he was transfigured before them. His face did shine as the sun. His raiment was white as light. And behold, there appeared Moses... And Elijah talking with him. Now, they were talking about the coming crucifixion because that's the subject of the Bible, the main subject of the Bible. The the subject of the Bible is not prosperity, healing, uh, any other topic. That's all good, fine and dandy in its place. But the main subject is the cross. The main subject is the death, burial, and resurrection of King Jesus. That's the subject. The main subject is his ascension into heaven to wait until the enemies become his footstool. The main subject is Christ coming back with the glorified and all the holy angels to rule and reign a thousand years and forever. That's the main subject. 
But inside that subject is the blood of Christ. Without the blood of the Lamb, you cannot be saved. Without the shedding of blood, there was no forgiveness of sins, the Bible says. Animals, blood animals, uh, blood from animals, I should say, could not forgive sin. It just covered sin in the Old Testament until the Lamb of God came. When the Lamb of God came, all sins were put upon His shoulders. Amen. And so Christ coming makes the way. He paid the price for our eternal life. Now listen, eternal life only comes from Jesus. No other entity in the universe gives eternal life except Christ. He alone. Now when he died on the cross, let me speculate just a minute, he being God had an infinite number of eternal timelines in his being. Which makes this thing personal. If a person rejects him as Lord then the timeline is wasted. And when judgment day comes, the Godhead will say, well, this timeline of eternity was, was given to you from the Son when He was on the cross. You didn't accept it, and therefore you're guilty. Christ alone gives eternal life. Now, how many have accepted Him and received that eternal life? It's in His Son only, in God's Son only. So He's the one that decides who's saved and who's not saved. My burden is why isn't God's Holy Spirit dealing with some people? I'll tell you right now, unless the Holy Spirit convicts of sin, that person cannot be saved. They frustrate the grace of God by turning deaf ear to the gospel. Here's the thing about the gospel. It's good news to those that hear it and believe it and receive Christ. But it's a curse to those that reject and walk away. And so this, this preaching thing is, is down to business here. We rejoice and have a good time in the Lord. But when it's all said and done, there's still a heaven and there's still a hell, and you keep that in mind next year. Amen. Now here we have Moses. Now Moses died. Everybody say Moses died. But yet he shows up on the Mount of Transfiguration in some type of a spirit body. Now there are those who teach he was glorified. I don't. But he shows up in a spirit body. But now Elijah had not died. You know this. Shows up in the actual literal physical body on the mountain with Christ. Now Elijah represents those that will not die when the Lord comes back. Moses represents all those that have died from Adam to our day. That'll be resurrected. And yet, here they are on the mountain. Elijah represents those who will not die when the trumpet sounds. Moses represents those that have died, but they're still going to be coming out and go to the mountain apart, and Jesus is going to be the one we're going to be gathering around. I'll know him. Glory to God. I said, I'll know him. So the last thing I want to say this morning is Luke chapter 10 and verse 30. These are nuggets. Hints. All through the Scripture, there's hints about this subject because it's very important. It's wonderful to be a Christian, but another to be ready to meet the Lord when He comes. That's part two. That's the reason you need to be in church. And everybody said amen. Why? Faith comes by hearing, hearing the Word of God. That's why. Amen. We need to be accountable and responsible to one another. Amen. 
Besides that, if a person forsakes the sin of themselves together, it's sinning. And I remind us, we're not sinners. This, this doctrine going around, you must reject it because it's a slide on the blood of Christ. There's a vast difference between a born-again child of God that could sin and don't want to in comparison to one that's a child of the devil that sins all the time and likes it. Big difference. I'm not saying Christians are perfect, but we are Christians. They were called Christians first in Antioch, not sinners. Now, I'm dogmatic about that. Well, he that doesn't sin can cast the first stone. Look, I'm not on First John chapter 1, but I've never said we haven't sinned because the Bible says all have sinned. But I'm saying God saves us out of it. We don't have to sin anymore. Oh, we might, and we probably will, but we've been set free from the control of sin that has put you in hell. Now, shout about that. Glory to God. I don't have to hack around and scream and holler to get this amen out of you. It's true. We'll never smell the flames of hell. By the way, Jesus didn't go there. I don't have to be, believe that Christ suffered in hell for my salvation. No, the cross was enough. That's wrong. You word of faith, people. I said it's wrong. You need to repent. Look, I don't care anymore. God's the one who called me to preach. You got nothing to do with it. Not a thing. You didn't save me. You didn't anoint me. It doesn't matter anymore. It's thus said the Lord. You got to repent and receive Christ. Oh, you're not going to make it. We have these hints on us, and there's an urgency in my soul this morning right now. An urgency because next year somebody may leave by the way of the grave, and what are we going to do? Oh, I don't know where they went. No. We need to be serving God 110%. Not let the devil push you around anymore. We need to get filled with the Holy Ghost and take authority. Glory to God. We don't need donuts and coffee on Sunday morning to draw the crowd. If the gospel's not good enough, you're going to hell anyway. You're judging. Call it what you will. Well, Jesus. No, he made a whip and ran them out. You're not Jesus. I'm his representative. And I'm speaking for him right now pretty good, by the way. Oh, he loves us. I, he know, I know he loves us. He knows how we are. Oh, he knows how we are. Absolutely. <laughs> He's given us these hints, and yet people, they hear but don't perceive. Why? Only the Holy Spirit can bring it home to you, people. I can try and scream and holler and jump around, do cartwheels. But it won't work. It's got to be the anointing of the Holy Spirit that brings it to your soul. And then you can get a hold of it, and it's something that will take you to glory. The gospel is able to save your soul. Jesus gave this little hint in Luke chapter 10 and verse 30. Amen. I was on this a while back. I'm going to read it again. Jesus answered, said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell upon thieves was stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. That typifies the human race. By chance, there came down a certain priest that way, and when they saw him, when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And verse 32, and likewise, the Levite, when he was at the, at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan. Oh, God. Jesus is the Samaritan. See how that's capitalized? Jesus is the good Samaritan, man. Nobody wanted us. Nobody cared. Religion walked right on by. 
We're too busy packing our Bible to church. We can't mess with you. We won't even invite you to church. Folks, that's wrong. You need to be inviting people to church. They can nitpick if they want to, but at least they've had a chance. God calls us to serve. He calls us to witness. He said, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you when I stand before the Father. No, I don't want the Lord to be ashamed of me and you. No, we need to be busy about the Father's business. Invite people. Well, they might. No, you don't want to be rejected. Look, if they reject you, they reject Christ because Christ is in you. That's all part of the gospel. That's all part of being a Christian. I tell you, when you become a real Christian, you're going to lose some friends. Hello, somebody. You're going to lose some friends. You won't be going to the same old places. In low places. Huh? You won't be doing the same things anymore. Huh? What you used to love, now you hate. Your friends will think you're crazy. You lost it. When I was first saved years ago, these people said, What's the matter with him? Has he got religion? Well, I don't know what I got, but it wasn't religion. This is another problem in our society. People think going to church makes them a Christian. Ha! -ah. It's like Brother Money says, sitting in a race car doesn't make you a race car driver. You got, a, you got a car? No. <laughs> However, if you are a child of God, the Lord expects you to be in the house of God. That's it. If he's your king, you will do what he requires because you love him. And it's the best deal. Praise God. So a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion upon him. There it is. The Lord loves us. It's beyond my comprehension, but he does. And he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and the wine. Now, the oil is a type of the Holy Spirit, and you know that. And the wine has alcohol in it, so it's, a, it's a, Analgesic, what do you call it? Uh, well, it's a sterilization effect upon the wound. You know, I watch these Westerns on TV, and they pour a little whiskey on the, the bullet, and then they drink the rest, you know. <laughs> Actually, drinking whiskey will not warm you up in the wintertime. It'll dehydrate you. Moving right along now. My dad, back in the day before we were saved, oh, you got to cut that flint out of your throat, you know. No, 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 but here, no, no. <laughs> Always an excuse, right? <laughs> but God loves us. But after a while, <laughs> after a while, uh, the Father can chastise. Oh, you don't want that? No. So he bound up his wounds, and he set him upon his own beast and brought him to the inn to take care of him. That's what I call a blessing. And on the morrow when he departed, now Jesus went back to heaven. You know that, don't you? On the morrow, Jesus went back to heaven. He took out two pence. Now, two pence, in my understanding, is two days' wages. Two days' wages. Which represents what? 2,000 years. You got it, Zanward. Why? It's a hint. It's right on the money, too. He took out two pence and gave to the host. That could be types, of the Holy, uh, you know, identified as the Holy Spirit. Who knows? And said to him, take care of him. You know the Holy Spirit's taking care of us. Turn your neighbor and say, the Holy Spirit's taking care of me. Praise God. Holy Spirit's taking care of you. Come on. The Holy Spirit's taking care of me. The Holy Spirit's taking care of you. We can say, the Holy Ghost is taking care of y'all. All right? He is. 
Even when you don't realize it, He is. He is. We need to cooperate with Him. So we took out two pence or two days' wages, which in type represents, again, to, re- to uh, speak to your pure minds, represents two days or 2,000 years of time. Have you got it? Since Jesus. All right. And by the way, it has been 2,000 years since Jesus. And we're the last generation. I call it the terminal generation. Now, don't misunderstand me. We're not supposed to dress in some white sheet and climb up in some tree and wait for the Lord to come. <laughs> no. We're to occupy and be busy about the Father's business. See? But He will come. On the morrow when he had departed, he got two pence and gave to the host and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay you. There's a hint. When I come again. <clears throat> When's he coming? After two days. He will come again. The Holy Spirit takes care of the believers and prepares us, even heals us. Everybody say heals. Heals us, getting us ready to meet our Lord when He comes. That's the whole purpose, to get us ready to meet Him. No spots on our garment. Holy. Holy. I said without holiness. No man shall see the Lord. What is holiness? Do your research. So the last verse today then is Revelation 22. I think you're getting the drift today. I hope. It's just crucial that you do. Let's look at 22 and verse 12. All right, praise the Lord. You glad you got a Bible today? Hallelujah. Behold, I come quickly. My reward is with me. Give every man according to his work shall be. See, we need to be busy with the Lord's work because the time's coming. We're not going to be able to do it. The night's coming. See, so we've got to be busy while it's day because the night comes and no man can work. That's what the Word says. So there's a darkness coming upon this planet. How many have noticed that? But it's going to force the church up. The real church is not going to submit to Satan's domain. No. They're going to rise to meet him. All go to greet him and have that marriage supper in the sky. Amen. That's what's coming when we're the generation. Can't be disproved. Why do you want to disprove it for? We need to accept what the Word of God teaches. We've got more than one account here. Amen. Amen. And so the Lord said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. In other words, he started this thing out, and he's big enough to finish it. He gave us his faith, and he's going to complete our faith. Amen. He cannot lose. 